Our guest today is the Executive Director, Chief Operating Officer of the Canada-China Business Council. Sarah, I'm going to try to pronounce it correctly. Kukulatos? Kutulakos. Kutulatos. Sarah is fluent in Mandarin. Uh, her interest in China began at the University of Wisconsin, where she studied Chinese marketing and international business. She holds an MBA in finance and operations from the from Simon School of Business at the University of Rochester. Prior to joining the Canada-China Business Council, Sarah worked for 11 years in marketing, product development, and management with a major multinational international corporation where she had multiple assignments involving China. Sarah has been involved in the greater China region since the late 1980s, where she lived and worked in Taiwan. She was the first non-Chinese employee of a local high-tech startup firm where she gained a deep understanding of the Chinese business practices. Since joining the Canada-China Business Council in 2007, Sarah has been able to reinvigorate the Council's mandate. Today, it is the premier bilateral trade investment organization in all of Canada. Under Sarah's leadership, the Canada-China Business Council has become a powerful advocate for the Canada-China relationship. Sarah has implemented numerous enhancements to member services, a substantially more effective online resources, an aggressive public relations agenda, and internal inf infrastructure improvements to make the organization one of the most efficient and recognized organizations in the country. Welcome to our show. Thank you, David. Well, tell us a little bit about the Canada-China Business Council in terms of its mandate, some of its core competencies from your perspective. Uh, the way I like to think about the council is that we, uh, we are there for our members. We are a nonprofit, nonpartisan, non-government membership association. And we're there to help organizations do more business with China and better business with China. So uh, the majority of our members are Canadian organizations, primarily corporations, but also educational institutions and government agencies. About 10% of our members are Chinese companies who are doing business in Canada. And uh, all of them want to see more trade and investment happening. So we really focus on three areas that help them to do that. One would be individual member services where we facilitate their business with China, whether it be advice, helping them with on the ground services. We have a very large SME agenda to help smaller or uh, smaller companies to incubate and to do business in Canada, uh, to help them negotiate, to help them um, uh, Really, the, the, the creativity that goes into it makes it endless what we can do for members. That's one of the mandates. Uh, the other one is to be a platform that helps companies build their own networks in and with China. And we put on a lot of events, anything from a small lunch with a couple of our CEOs who should know each other, all the way up to state dinners with the heads of Canada and China. And members use those in all kinds of ways. And I think of it as bringing people together in interesting ways that help them to do more business because they've built their own networks. And then thirdly, we do pursue a policy of advocacy where we're not a lobby group, but we look at the environment between Canada and China and say, how can it be easier to do business? Uh, and what can we do to help Canadian companies do business more easily in China or vice versa. There's quite a distinction though between advocacy and lobbying. Absolutely, is there, there is, yes. And so we're really more a voice of our, of our members, um, but when it comes to uh, you know, individual lobbying, that's, uh, that's the mandate of other organizations, not of ours. In terms of the, the balance of Canadian firms versus Chinese firms, mm -hmm. is there a desire to try to increase the number of Chinese companies who are in Canada to become part and parcel of the Canada-China Business Council? I, I think that is, that is a desire that we have. We certainly want companies to be members who want to be members. And so that means companies that are looking to make sure that in the context of their own investments in Canada, they are accepted as Canadian companies. And that's the benefit that we bring as a truly bilateral organization and as a Canadian organization that understands China. There are lots of support groups out there um, in, in this field, many of whom are you know, Chinese uh, in origin. And we are really a mix and a hybrid. And one of the things that 
uh, we do for Chinese investors is help them to understand how to be more Canadian. Because ultimately, their investment in Canada, uh, the origin of it should be irrelevant. What's relevant is, are they bringing economic benefit to Canada? Are they bringing economic benefit to themselves? And uh, you know, is business going well? So how long has the Canada-China Business Council been around? 36 years. We just held our 36th AGM. And uh, it, it, it's really a case of members helping members since the very beginning. Back in 1978, a number of high-profile business people went to the Prime Minister at the time and said, this China stuff looks hard. We think the government should help us. And the Prime Minister said, hey, I was one of the first, I made Canada one of the first countries to diplomatically recognize China. We've already taken a big step for you. So why don't you establish an organization so that you guys can help yourselves? And that was the genesis of, of what we did. So you're 36 years old. Mm -hmm. Tell us from your perspective, some of the cultural challenges for Canadians attempting to do business in China. Well, the, the, the cultural challenges are really significant. And even for somebody that understands China like I do, you realize all the time that you will never be able to be 100% immersed in the culture. And when I do cultural training for companies, I often find that it's a useful review even for myself. Um, you know, one of the biggest differences is um, what they call um, the context of your communication. So Canada is what's considered a low context culture. Much of what we mean is in what we say. It's very straightforward. You don't like me, you tell me you don't like me, and you tell me why. In China, as in many Asian countries, it's a high context communication. Much of the meaning is not in the words, but is in the body language or in what is not said. And to be able to operate in that environment, you need very good radar. Um, because if you don't have it, you just barrel your way through and you might be making mistakes that you don't understand. I would think that the body language in China would have to be really in alignment with what the spoken word is. Would that be correct? Well, often, you know, you might see discomfort in the body language and hear nothing coming out in the words. Or you might hear words that seem positive to you, but in the end they're saying no. And so you have to be able to, um, you have to be able to understand that. Also, there's a real uh, propensity to not speak up if you're not happy. And I learned this in my first job with this uh, company in Taiwan, where um, uh, you know there were some things that I did as a young North American executive that seemed like a really great idea. I suggested that we should recycle paper in the office, for example. And for a while, the person who managed our office had a very traditional, non-Western thinking way. He hated that idea. He never told me that. It ultimately came out in a blow up that happened months later where all these things had uh, accumulated and, uh, and and ultimately came to light. And so the um, the, the, the lesson I learned from that was the first time somebody doesn't like what you do, they'll keep it to themselves. The second time, they'll still keep it to themselves. When it finally gets so bad that there's a third time, then they'll go tell somebody else. Eventually, it might get to you. So this is where if, you know, I can think of examples back then. I was 23 years old. If I had had better radar, I would have either brought the conversation to a, not a confrontation, but you know, said, let's, let's discuss this disagreement we're having. Or I would have used the services of a third party who this person might have been confiding in to try to resolve it. What would you advise a small and medium-sized business person uh, or organization that is attempting to do business in China? What, what are some of the do's and don'ts that you would uh, advocate to this particular company? Well, you need to, you need to give it the time and attention that it, uh, that it deserves. So if, you, if China becomes an important part of your strategy, you can't just um, do it in a haphazard way. And the, as an executive, this either means that you need to make a significant personal commitment to it, or you need to have an organizational structure that allows those commitments to be made by others and for you to come in when it makes sense. One of the interesting things I see happen recently, or actually over the last few years, with companies that are doing very well in China is their senior executives are taking the time to live there. So. Um, 
one of the companies that's going to be recognized in our Business Excellence Awards next week is a, an environmental remediation company. Their COO moved his family to China this year. You know, he thought it would just be better for the company for him to be there. And being immersed in that environment allows him as an executive to get a whole different perspective on how that Is works. Is that well received by the Chinese? Oh, I believe so. Uh, I was just in Shanghai a couple of weeks ago. Uh, IMAX, you might be aware, is, yes. is a country, company that's doing extremely well in China. Their CFO is based in Shanghai. You know, how many companies do you know that send their CFO to go live in China when they're a worldwide business? Um, and so that's often a pretty significant indication of a commitment that the company is so making. So it really has to be a long-term commitment if, in fact, China's on your radar screen as a possible either a purchaser of your product or you're purchasing product from them. Yes. And also, the other thing that you can do is find somebody who is very committed to your company um, and is able to... <coughs> commit to the country well. So I think of Bombardier, for example, which is a very well-known company in Canada, doing extremely well in China. The gentleman that is the head of their China operations, um, he, you know, he, he's a force to be reckoned with in China. And he is able to work in the Canadian environment, but also in a Chinese environment where he's negotiating subway deals or helping with aerospace or other things. You can tell that he is just completely turned on uh, and uh, able to operate in that environment. And uh, a company like Bombardier is served very, very well by it. But he is a gentleman that lived in Montreal, studied in Montreal, worked for the company first. And so a smaller company won't always have the benefit of having somebody- Nor the resources. Nor the resources, but it's one of the, things that Canada has to offer is that there are a lot of very talented people here that have good China work experience. Matching them up is, is a bit bigger challenge, but it certainly is possible. And, uh, Am I correct in assuming that the Canada-China Business Council uh, has offices in uh, Beijing and, and Shanghai? Am we I do, right? in Beijing and Shanghai. Could you, could you share some information about that? Yeah, the, our Beijing office is our biggest. We've been there since 1980. 1980? Yes. Yeah, so wow. we've been there a long time, and um, mm. you know our brand in China is very strong because we have been there through thick and thin, through multiple government administrations. Um, Shanghai, we've set up since I believe it's 1984. Um, it's been quite a long time, and both of those offices act as resources for our members, in particular for companies that might not have the on-the-ground operations themselves yet. So we see a lot of help that they give to members in connecting them locally, in uh, helping to incubate them. We have incubation space in both offices that companies use for six months, 12 months. We just had somebody finally move out after 10 years. Um, uh, so sometimes it's a longer term uh, uh, operation. And particularly if you stay such that you don't need to build a big team in China, having one person in a Canadian environment um, is, is really useful. Sometimes you want that rep of yours in China to keep understanding that they're working for a Canadian company, that there's an advantage to that brand and that affiliation. The offices also act as a bit of a Canadian community builder, particularly in Beijing, where we also operate as a chamber of commerce. We do Canada Day. Canada Day gets usually about 1,200 people. Isn't that nice? Um, we do a Christmas party, because if you are a Canadian living in China, sometimes you miss that aspect of life. Tell us about relationships. I mean, much has been written, much has been said about the importance of working in China, but you have to develop relationships first. How real is that? And do you have any examples in terms of where relationships have really paid off in terms of uh, the corporate side? I mean, the relationship building is extremely important. Um, you hear about the concept of guanxi, and when I talk about various Spell aspects... Spell that. G-U-A-N... XI basically means relations and guanxi. guanxi. And guanxi is important even for us, right? In every culture, the building of relationships is important. Um, but I have these, uh, these pictures that I often use that were drawn by a Chinese artist living in Germany describing graphically how things are different in Germany, just good analog for Canada or North America, versus China. And in the concept of relationships, um, the, the graphic for our relationships is fairly simple, right? You maybe have, you know, a wheel and spoke, and, you know, there's some complexity, but it's not 
so complex. In China, it's just a tangled, tangled web. And one of the things that, I, that we find is that uh, chi people in China spend a very great deal of time developing and maintaining their relationships. And that becomes a big part of their personal life. Um, and for those of us that have lived in China, it's often a bit of a challenge because we will find that our colleagues will spend their evenings, their weekends doing things that look like work, but are in the service of keeping that guanxi up. Uh, and that creates a big contrast to, uh, to a North American that maybe has a focus on work-life balance. So I was bringing up the example of one of our embassy staff who does a very good job at what he does. And I, I, uh, he laughed as I said, I bet Lee's wife doesn't appreciate all the time that he needs to spend uh, being away from his family to develop these relationships. Uh, and so it's harder for us as foreigners to do that. Um, what, do, what, what does that require, though? Does that mean going to their families for dinner? Does it mean attending social functions? social functions, lunches, um, dinners, coffee out, drinks. Um, it might, might involve giving gifts. You, know, you have to be careful with gifts these days in China. Um, but um, showing appreciation, um, maybe you introduce him to somebody who can help him, and ultimately he would introduce you to somebody who can help you. Um, there's a very much a reci reciprocity function at, at work, and so we do find that people in China spend a lot of time keeping that up, and it's tough for us as foreigners to do it at the same level. So one of the pieces of advice we give to foreigners when they go to China is try to bring something that's very unique that your Chinese counterpart wouldn't be able to get from an average contact. So that might be the benefit of your expertise that has something that is, you know, perhaps is unique in China, something about your Canadianness. Um, and um, you know, thinking about examples of people who've done this very well. Um, is our, is our embassy uh, helpful in terms of this process of developing the relationships or? They would be helpful in terms of, you know, for any individual executive, they can help to make introductions, but they are, you know, they're not able to keep the guanxi going for a, an individual once the connection is made. You really need to keep doing that yourself. And one of the criticisms I've heard, um, actually on my first trip to China in this job seven years ago, I got lectured at by a governor of a province who said, you Canadians, you, you come in and your delegations and you talk a good line and then two years later you show up with another delegation. What happened in the meantime? Well, part of that is Guanxi. There's also a, an issue of action, but uh, you know, did the people in that delegation end up following up with those officials that they met, with those business people? Um, was there really action taken? And so my, one of my goals in life is not to have us Canadians get yelled at, that we really do show that we can follow up and follow through and aggressively pursue the opportunities there. And how receptive have Canadian companies been to that kind of what I would call very strategic and wise advice if you want to do business in China? Some are, some are receptive, not all. We, I always feel like we're falling a little bit behind of other countries. Um, now, in certain groups, you know, if you come to one of our big events, these are mostly people who get it, right? So they're already there in China. They're working and developing the connections. Um, but there are plenty of companies in Canada that have said, yeah, I see there's a lot of opportunity there, but China looks kind of hard, or I'm worried about intellectual property, or, um, in, and in a logical context of comparing growth opportunities. If you have a growth opportunity next door that doesn't require a lot of additional work, of course you're gonna take it. But the key is if you look at the future, not only is the growth happening in places like Asia and in particular China, but China is a part of the growth of our traditional partners. And this is where you can't put your head in the sand and say, well, if I just go like that, maybe China will go away. China is there, and it's a part of what you're doing. And even if you decide you don't want to be in China or competing there or sourcing from there, you really do have to understand how China may be impacting your overall value chain. Tell us about trust and developing trust with, with the Chinese. In any negotiation, trust becomes either a barrier or a risk or it can become quite strategically advantageous if you have trust. 
Are there some practices that Canadians ought to be aware of in terms of how they could uh, establish some trust with their counterparts in China? This, this comes with the relationship building and the realization that you might go and you might have some meetings across a boardroom table, but that is not the end of the, that, that will not get you where you need to go in a transaction. And this is a difference between a relational culture like China and a relatively transactional culture. You know, if we're doing a deal with an American company, great, you go in and you negotiate, you shake hands and you're done. In China, there will always be perhaps a dinner after the meeting and a, a, a you know, multiple stage set of negotiations. And not all of those negotiations actually happen at the negotiating table. Some of those things will happen at or particularly after the trust has been established through the building of a personal relationship. And so I know that a lot of Canadians say, oh, geez, all these dinners or, you know, it takes an awful lot of time. It does. But if you don't do it, then you are lacking in the building of that trust. Um, I also find that, you know, people often will say, well, do you need to know the language? Do you need to have had experience over there? I find personally, it helps me quite a bit because it will open doors, right? People will talk to me and say, okay, she gets it, right? And that helps to keep things going, but that's not enough. And it is possible to get to that point without having any of that background. I see people do it very well, but you have to be able to show commitment. You have to show up time and time again. I was talking to one of the premier's offices that went on the recent mission to China, and it had been their fourth trip. And she said, you know, everything kind of went from concept to reality this time, where the people we were meeting with, I recognized them. Um, you know, we had met them on several trips to China and they had made trips to our province. Um, we were able to talk about their kid and where they were studying and that element of the personal relationship. So trust had been developed. And, uh, and so that's where, and I think being able to act upon what you say will happen is, um, is another important part of trust. You know, you need to be able to demonstrate that you'll make good on what you've said you would make good on. I've been reading some studies with, in terms of what's happening in Australia uh, the Germans, uh, the British, uh, they seem to be quite active in, in China. And they seem to be uh, doing a lot of the things that you're suggesting. So how do we rack up against some of our competing nations, whether it be the United States, Great Britain, Australia, or indeed Germany? We are, we are behind in many ways. I think this week's announcement of the Australia-China Free Trade Agreement um, becomes a stark realization that Australia yet again has beaten us to the punch. And a part of that is, so it takes all levels of government and civil society to really make this relationship with China happen. And it's not easy, it's not without risk, um, and our countries are not without their differences. But Australia has some of the same issues with China that we do, it's people come through in surveys of having the same suspicions of China, et cetera, and yet Australia went ahead and finally signed a, a free trade agreement. And in reading the analysis of that free trade agreement, one of the uh, very first comments an Australian law firm made was, well, we're not gonna have this advantage very long because other countries will come in behind us. They're already thinking about the fact that we better get this ratified quickly because somebody else will be on our heels. Well, we're always on the heels, right? You know. Um, and this is, a, this is a challenge for us. And so I think it is important that from the very top levels of government, a strategic uh, decision is made to be adequately aggressive with China. Um, some of the right words have been there. You've seen the head of EDC, the head of the Bank of Canada saying, uh, you know, both Carney and the, the new head have said, we got to start exporting more to China, right? Canadian companies have to start doing more. So you see even people for whom they don't have necessarily a vested interest in saying that, knowing it's important. But you need it to happen from, from the top, and that's something we continue to push for. 